So, um, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to COPS number four, I believe, with uh, Maria here. Uh, Maria, you are a third year of going on fourth year in the uh, mm -hmm. in the math department. Um, yeah. And you have been interning at uh, at Dant over the summer, right? Yeah. Uh, and you'll be telling us a bit about uh, a bit about what you've been doing with modeling cosmic inflation. Um, so, uh, Maria, you've said that you would like to take questions during the talk. Uh, so, mm -hmm. if anybody has uh, anybody has any questions regarding the content or regarding um, regarding more conceptual stuff, either you can post it in the chat or you can unmute yourself and be brave and speak out loud. Um, and um, uh, just for the record, I believe you said you were at Christ, right? Yeah. And what was remembering? Excellent. Okay. Um, so then I guess we I shall leave it to you. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you, Oscar. And thank you, everyone, for coming. Let's start uh, with some housekeeping. I'm going to set the speed of light to 1, H bar to 1, and Planck's mass to 1. Um, if you care about these factors, you can always recover them from your final result using dimensional analysis. And I'm going to use the mostly plus sign convention, which is the usual uh, convention for general relativity stuff, although it's opposite to what is usually used in quantum stuff, like quantum field theory that we may talk about a bit at the end of the talk. All right, so as Oscar said, uh, questions are very welcome at any point in time of the talk. And um, what we are going to talk about today, first, FOW cosmology, which is the standard uh, theory of cosmology then inflation, which is really the core topic of the talk. And then if we have time, we will have a very brief introduction to free quantum field theory in both Minkowski space-time and FRW space-time, the later being the one relevant for cosmology. So let's get started with FRW cosmology. I should say that this is going to be a very brief introduction to cosmology, and I'm going to tell you just the stuff that is relevant for inflation. So. This is the cosmic microwave background. This is radiation, so photons, that have been traveling to us without interacting almost since the start of the universe. For reference, um, these photons last interacted when the universe was only 300,000 years old, and now the universe is almost 14 billion years old. And so in cosmological scales, this is really just from the very start of the universe, and we can think of this almost like a photograph of the Big Bang. And indeed, it's one of the main pieces of evidence, as we will see, uh, that we have to support our theory of the Big Bang. So how do we do cosmology? Well, we start with the cosmological principle that says that at any given moment in time, the universe is homogeneous and isotropic when looking at large scales. Homogeneity means that it looks the same at every point, and isotropy means that it looks the same in all directions. And we have good evidence to believe that this is true. Uh, one is a, a redshift survey, like this one here, and the other is the cosmic microwave background uh, from the previous slide. So we'll assume um, that the cosmological principle holds, and then we'll try to study the universe uh, using it. Um, so now we are focusing on the uh, geometry of, of the universe, of this um, spatial part of our universe. And we can have three types of geometries that satisfy um, isotropy and homogeneity. And these are flat space, Euclidean space, that's really R3. And then we will have a space with negative curvature, that's hyperbolic geometry, or a space with positive curvature, um, that's spherical geometry. If you don't know what the curvature is, uh, don't worry, it doesn't really matter. But this picture here may help a bit. Uh, we have here two-dimensional surfaces on flat, hyperbolic and spherical geometries. But do not be confused, oh, these are really two-dimensional surfaces and our universe is a three-dimensional, like the space part of it is three-dimensional. So if I were to say that our universe has a spherical geometry, I will not be saying that our universe is a sphere uh, because it is not. But this is getting too abstract. And to avoid that, uh, well, I'm going to tell you what the curvature of the universe is. And it's zero, at least to a very high accuracy. And so I will discuss later in the talk why this is the case and how it is the case. 
but for now it's going to save me some work from actually writing the curvature term in my equations. Okay, so now we know um, the geometry of our universe, but that, just, that was just for the spatial part, but our universe is really four dimensional, it's a space time. And so we need to include time and we do this with the FRW metric, uh, which is this one here. Um, can you actually see me typing? Uh, yeah, I, I guess I'll do that. Okay, um, it, which is really similar to the Minkowski metric from a special relativity, except that we have this factor here, A, which is a function of time. It's known as the scale factor, and it tells us how the universe expands. And you could think of it as the radius of the universe, although, as I said before, the universe is not a sphere or anything like that. So yeah, that's the scale factor that's uh, really helpful and cosmology is all about understanding the scale factor and how it evolves in time. And um, for that, uh, the Hubble parameter, uh, which is this ratio here of the scale factor, of the time derivative of the scale factor and the scale factor is really is quite useful. And I should emphasize that it's a function of time. It, in general, it's not constant. Right, so now we need equations to understand uh, the scale factor. Uh, and how it changes in time. And how do we do it? Well, strange as it may seem, we model the universe like a fluid. Why? Well, the cosmological principle is telling us that we should think of the content of the universe as part of a homogeneous and isotropic fluid. And that even though we can see the galaxies here from Earth as very big objects, we should think of them as atoms in a cosmological fluid in a cosmological fluid, at least when looking from far, far away. And so uh, this is usually done in general relativity and the uh, main equations of cosmology come from general relativity. Although one of, of them, uh, that's the continuity equation here where rho is the energy density of our uh, fluid and, and P is the pressure of our, of our cosmological fluid. Um, it might also be familiar to you from fluid dynamics, at, at least the name. It's really just a conservation equation. And here, well, P, I said it was the pressure. Uh, we usually need to need to specify the pressure in terms of the energy density. Uh, and we do that with an equation of a state that we usually take from statistical physics. And I will discuss um, in a minute um, a couple of examples uh, of equation of states and how, how that um, affects the dynamics of our universe. And finally, we have the Friedman equation, which in my opinion, it's probably the most important equation in cosmology uh, that relates the Hubble parameter to the free, to the um, energy density. And it's a consequence of, uh, well, it follows from Einstein's equations of general relativity. Uh, so in principle, we have these three equations and we, we could be able to solve uh, for the dynamics of the universe. In practice, this is quite hard. So we look at a simple case. Uh, there's are simple fluid solutions where the pressure is proportional to the energy density, the constant of proportionality, um, we call it omega, and it's a third for radiation, and it's um, we take it to be zero for non-relativistic matter. If we plug it into the continuity equation and then solve, uh, we, we get a first order ODE, and we can solve for the energy density in terms of A, the scale factor. And if we plug this relationship into the right-hand side of the Friedman equation, we get again a first order differential equation, which we can solve for the evolution in time of the scale factor, which is um, usually uh, a monomial in time, said when when omega equals to minus one. In this case, uh, that I will discuss in the next slide. Um, if we go back to the um, expression for the energy density, this case gives us a really constant energy density because well, the x expand there is um, zero, so uh, we get constant energy density. And this case is quite important, is the Sitter space time. Uh, on it, as I said before, the energy is constant, energy density constant, so is the pressure. And it corresponds to a cosmological constant. Uh, you see where the name comes from. And it's really representing dark energy, although um, we, we really have no idea what dark energy is. Um, but that's not important for us. Really. And in this case, well, from the Friedman equation, the Hubble parameter is also constant, and hence the scale factor grows exponentially with time, um, which is a faster growth than the polynomial time that we had for the other uh, types of, of simple solutions that we saw in the previous slide. And I should, you, you may realize here that, um, well, the big one, which is uh, the moment in time where the scale factor is zero, 
here it's not really a time equals to zero, but a time tending to minus infinity. And this may seem a problem, but it's not a physical problem. It's known as a coordinate singularity, and it's just a bad choice of our coordinates. And we can do a clever change of variables, and we'll get rid of this problem. But yeah, this is not uh, important for us today either. So, um, summary of important solutions. Um, we can have radiation where the scale factor grows as the square root of time, and that gives us uh, energy density that goes as one over a to the power of four. We can have non-relativistic matter uh, where the scale factor grows as t to the two thirds, and that gives us energy density that decays as one over a cube. And this is really just conservation of energy because while the energy density is energy over volume and the volume of the universe goes as a cube so the fact that the energy density goes as one over a cube is just saying that the energy density is constant th that the energy is constant and a similar argument can be made for the energy density of radiation and the, here the extra factor of one over a comes from cosmological redshift which is um, analogous to the relativistic Doppler effect that you may be familiar with. And then finally, uh, dark energy, um, where we have exponential growth of the scale factor, but the energy density is constant. So uh, with this in mind, we can move on to the, uh, to go back to the Friedman equation, where here I have now included the curvature term that I previously neglected. I've included for reasons that will be obvious in a minute. And I've written the energy density as a sum of uh, different fluid components uh, that correspond to the previous solutions that we saw before. And hopefully it's clear from this expression and, and the table of the previous slide that um, as the universe expands, as the scale factor grows, the dominant term in the sum changes. So initially, uh, when A is very small, the energy density in radiation is going to be the uh, biggest term and then it'll be matter and then when a is very very large um it's the dark energy term that's going to be uh, bigger and obviously the exact moment in time where uh this um dominant term changes depends on the proportionality con proportionality constants that i have not included here but uh i think the qualitative idea uh that's the important bit and having said that uh, we, we can rescale the energy density of all the fluid components, but by this uh, critical energy density, P, uh, rho C, and obtain these fractional energy densities, omegas, which are time dependent functions. And we do uh, a weird rescaling here with the, of the curvature term, but the reason why we do this particular rescaling is so that the Friedman equation takes this nice, simple form where all the omegas sum up to one, uh, which I think it's uh, yeah, quite nice. And the good thing about uh, these fractional energy densities is that we can measure them, we can observe them. And as I said before, these are functions of time, but we can measure them today. And when we measure them today, what we observe is uh, that the fractional energy density in matter is about 31% of the energy of the universe, uh, of which five points come from baryonic matter. That's the stuff made out of baryons, like protons and neutrons. And then 26 points come from dark matter, which uh, we're quite unsure uh, about what it is. And then 69% of the energy of the universe is in dark energy. But uh, the energy in radiation is very, very small uh, and we, we can neglect it. And finally, the curvature term, we have bound for it and they are quite close to zero, they are quite small. So that's why I said before that, well, the universe is approximately flat. Although uh, on the next chapter on inflation, we will discuss this uh, further. And these numbers are the reason why this set of uh, parameters, omegas, are known as the lambda CDM model. Lambda comes from dark energy, and CDM stands for cold, i.e. non-relativistic, uh, DM dark matter. And finally, to close this chapter, uh, here's a brief timeline of the important events in the expansion of our universe. We had the big one that was time equal to zero. Then I have not talked about inflation yet, but it happened just a few fractions of a second after um, the big one. When the universe was 50,000 years old, um, we had the matter radiation equality. This is the point at which the energy 
in matter in the universe becomes as large as the energy in radiation. Before that, it was radiation, uh, the dominant term. After that, it's matter that dominates. And that is up until 10 billion years after the Big Bang, when we have matter lambda quality. This is the point at which the energy in dark energy becomes as large as the energy in matter. And after that, it's dark energy, the dominant term, uh, up until today. So up until today, when the universe is about 13.8 billion years old, since, since the universe was 10 billion years old, it's been dark energy, it's been the cosmological constant, what has been driving the expansion of the universe. Um, so this is the end of this first chapter. Um, are there any questions? It seems there aren't. Cool. Um, so, yeah. oh, what's that a question? I have one, one, one sorry, uh, question. Yeah. Where was the, um, perhaps, where was the uh, omegas, the smaller omegas? for matter, uh, light, and dark energy? How were they derived? Like, where, where do you oh. get? Oh, yeah. So, like, you mean, why, why do we choose this form? Yeah. Why is it the third? Why is it zero? Why is it minus one? Um, yeah, so a third uh, does um, purely from a statistical physics. Uh, I don't remember the actual equation, but uh, there's, like, one of these equations of states that you derive for uh, relativistic stuff. Um, the one for matter, uh, again, it's really an approximation, but it's just like taking taking a limit and like it, it's it's very close to zero, although it's not exactly zero. And and the war for dark energy, well, uh, there are two ways you can go about it. Uh, you can say, well, uh, there's like really nothing stopping me here from like consider a fluid with that um, value for omega, like put in there minus one and see what happens. And then there's another way yeah. which I have not really explained here today, but there's a the cosmological constant can be directly explicitly included in Einstein's equation, and then uh, the term can appear also in in the Friedman equation. So it'll be it'll be a further term here that has a lambda that's the cosmological constant, and to realize that that equation, um, we treat it as well like a fluid, but it's just really analogous because it has the same dynamics. So instead of saying that it comes from or the lambda term, we just say, well, there's no other um, energy density component. It's just uh, we, we invent this uh, energy density corresponding to dark energy. Okay. Uh, so Thank you much. your answer, it comes, it comes from Einstein's equation. OK, thank you much. If anybody has any other questions, uh, feel free to post them in the chat and I will read them out loud or, or unmute yourself, as previously mentioned. Cool. Um, uh, where were we? Yeah, so I'm going to have uh, like half a minute break if you want to drink some water or stretch your legs. Well, I guess you're all drinking water, but I'm not. All right, well, like this, this is looking so awkward. Uh, I think uh, we should continue. Um, I didn't really time it. Um, <laughs> chapter two, inflation. What is inflation? Well, inflation is a phase of accelerated expansion in the very early universe in a, approximately the center space time, which we met in the previous uh, chapter, and that was exponential growth of the scale factor. And let me emphasize what I mean by very early universe. Like, there's still much we don't know about inflation, but we have compelling reasons to believe that it happened and that it started at about 10 to the minus 36 seconds after the Big Bang and lasted up to 10 to the minus 33, 10 to the minus 32 seconds after the Big Bang. And this is just like really a tiny fraction of a second after the Big Bang. And I don't know about you, but I find this number mind blowing. Anyways, um, why do we need inflation after all? Why can't we just get away with the standard cosmology that we met on the previous chapter? 
Well, uh, there are some problems with it, some of which have been worrying cosmologists for more than 40 years now. And I will discuss a couple of them here. Um, one is the curvature or the flatness problems problem that I briefly touched on the previous uh, section. And it's really the question, why will the universe be flat to such a high accuracy? Because our universe shows no sign of a spatial curvature. We can't say for sure it's exactly flat, but observations bound the curvature term to be very small, as we saw on the previous section. And it's not really hard to show that a universe with no curvature is a fixed point of the dynamics of the universe, but it is an unstable fixed point um, of the dynamics. So any small amount of curvature present at the very early universe should have grown over time, and we should observe it today. But we do not. And if we were to attribute the current bounds in the curvature term to these perturbations, and if we trace that solution backwards in time to the start of the universe, the amount of curvature in the at the start of the universe will be a ridiculously small number uh, that will make us wonder why do we have these magical um, initial conditions like there's some fight tuning here why why do we have um, a universe that's like almost exactly flat and we don't like that in physics we want a more reasonable explanation and we do this with inflation the way we do it is well uh, this accelerated expansion that we had during inflation literally kills uh, every amount of curvature that's present in the universe. It's not really hard to show that, but uh, I won't go into the details. So inflation drives the curvature to zero, and at the end of inflation, we are left with a flat universe. Uh, and so we, we then can start the standard for W cosmology that we met on the previous section. And so we, we can have all the dynamics that we previously had with a flat universe. So that's right, that's one problem solved. And another is the horizons problem, which is as follows. The cosmic microwave background is almost perfectly uniform and isotropic, but it has some correlations across the sky. And these correlations are really the same, even at points in the sky that had not been in causal contact since the start of the universe. Um, what I mean is uh, the picture here is uh, good for it, I suppose. Um, there are problems here, po points there, and points there that um, whose past light cones do not intersect and had not uh, really met at any point in the history of the universe. So really that will violate causality uh, because then uh, we, we, we cannot have a point at the uh, big one that influenced uh, both points. And so the only way to explain that will be to say, well, the initial conditions of the universe were such that uh, these correlations already existed at the uh, time of the big one, and then they just evolved there. But again, we don't like having these magical initial conditions. We want a better explanation for it. And we solve it uh, with inflation. And how we solve it with inflation? Well, this accelerated expansion basically stretches the amount, the distance that light can travel since the big one to the microwave background. And so uh, the future light cone of a particle um, at the big one, uh, of a point at the, part, uh, at the big one can be a stretch. And so uh, we then can have this, uh, a part, a, a, an event at the big one that can influence um, the whole sky at the time of the microwave background. So that's how we do it with inflation. And then finally, I will touch on the magnetic monopole problem, which is that the standard cosmology together with the with extensions to the standard model of particle physics predict the existence of magnetic monopoles in our universe, but we do not observe them. However, if we add inflation into our theory, um, the predictions tell us that we, we, we still have magnetic monopoles, but the probability of having magnetic monopoles in our observable universe is just a tiny number. So it's no surprise that we have not seen magnetic monopoles. And then there are more problems like the phase coherence, coherence problem and the scale invariant problem. Um, the former I won't talk about, the later I will talk about later. So how do we model inflation? So all fundamental theories of physics um, are half an action principle and still there's inflation. And for that, we, we use some scalar field. We, it's known as the inflaton field. We call it phi. 
And then in analogy to Lagrangian uh, mechanics, uh, we can write, write down this action, this uh, Lagrangian, that's really kinetic energy minus potential energy. However, we like things to be invariant. So we need to add this factor of the square root of minus the determinant of the metric. Uh, this factor really comes from uh, GR. And, and we also have to transform uh, the kinetic term to this invariant kinetic term uh, contracted with the metric. And if we expand that out uh, with the FRW metric for flat space, well, we get this expression for the action. And finally, uh, the cosmological principle is telling us that the universe is homogeneous. So we can assume that the inflaton does not depend on space. So we can get rid of the gradient term. And this is uh, the action that we get for inflation. And then um, you see in variational principles through the Euler Lagrange equations, as usual um, in physics, we obtain the equation of motion for the inflaton, which is this one here. And if you look at it for long enough, this is really just like. Newton's second law, we, where we have this acceleration term. And this term here, well, if we bring it to the other side, that's uh, minus the gradient of the potential. So that's really Newton's second law. And we have this extra term here, um, which is known as Hubble friction or Hubble drag. It's proportional to the Hubble parameter. And it also, it's also proportional to the time derivative of the inflaton. So that's why it's known as Hubble friction or Hubble drag, uh, because that's really like the speed of the inflaton. It's a purely relativistic effect, and it's quite useful to understand inflation. And finally, uh, we need to solve now for the dynamics of the universe, but uh, we need to solve for phi, the inflaton, but we also need to uh, solve for A, the scale factor. So we need to close the system with the Friedman equation. And for the Friedman equation, we need the energy density. Um, we could naively think that the energy density is just uh, kinetic energy plus uh, potential energy, although you know, this is really not kinetic energy. I just said that it was kinetic energy. And the actual proof for this comes from the stress energy tensor from general relativity. But if you believe me, uh, this is your Friedman equation. And so now you have a pair of couple uh, differential equations, which in theory, you could be able to solve. In practice, it is quite hard to, quite hard to solve for them. Uh, this There's the hamilton jacobi formalism, which helps for that. Uh, although I won't discuss it, but if you are curious to read on that. And more generally, we usually have to do the what's known as the slow roll approximation. And it's that under certain conditions, known as the slow roll conditions, we can neglect uh, some of the terms in, in both of the equations, and then we can directly integrate up to obtain the expression for the inflaton as a function of time. So how inflation works, uh, we have this space of a slow roll um, during which the slow roll approximation holds. And it can be shown that there, uh, the pressure is approximately minus the energy density, which is really the equation of a state that we had for dark energy. And that is good news because dark energy gave us exponential expansion of the scale factor of the universe. And that is what we were looking for in inflation. So that's good. Um, and at the end of inflation, well, the slow roll approximation no longer holds, and the expansion starts to decelerate, and the inflaton oscillates around the minimum of the potential in a process which is known as reheating, that is transferring energy from the inflaton field to other fields in the standard model of particles, um, such that at the end of inflation, there's matter and there's light in our universe, and they have energy. Uh, and so the standard cosmology that we saw in the previous section can start then again um, growing as we uh, saw before. And I should say that the details of this um, process of reheating are not really clear. And in particular, there's, um, there's an issue that's specifying the initial conditions at the start of inflation uh, for the inflaton, so like its initial value and also its um, time derivative. And the problem for that is that we, we need them to satisfy certain conditions such that the slow roll approximation holds and such that reheating happens in the way it's meant to happen so that then we can have a standard cosmology after inflation. And this is probably one of the most controversial bits about inflation because 
we we said that we needed inflation to explain uh, the flatness problem and the rises problem, but we are really just changing the same problem with initial conditions from uh, flatness and, and rises to to the initial conditions of the inflaton. So uh, this is still a bit unclear, but one thing that helps is to consider a more general Lagrangian, uh, what's known as p, uh, a function of the inflaton and an effects, uh, which is our invariant kinetic term that we had before. And what's good about these theories is that the space of initial conditions that lead to um, a valid reheating process um, is bigger. So, so then it's not that unlikely or not like that unexpected that we had the right initial conditions for inflation to happen. Um, so this is how um, I'm told cosmologists uh, get away with the problems of inflation. They consider uh, this more general Lagrangian which um, should be uh, clear that if we set x, uh, p equals to x minus v, we recover the canonical Lagrangian that we had uh, before. And for the equation of motion, well, if we consider a homogeneous term, uh, a homogeneous field as before, uh, we can neglect the gradient term. And, and then Euler Lagrange equations as before, uh, that gives us the equation of motion for the inflaton. Uh, it's really the same as before, although there are more terms, but it's not more complex. Um, we need to close the system with the Friedman equation. However, this time there's really no intuition for why the energy density should take this uh, form. Uh, the reason lies again in, in general relativity. Right, so to so Just close... to clarify, one, one question. Clarify it. The, the x's you have on the bottom of p, that's partial derivatives? Yeah, sorry, yeah. So um, I know my notation has been a bit confusing. Uh, here, these are partial derivatives with respect to x. And, and here, if I include a phi, it's partial derivative with respect to the inflaton um, of p. But uh, when I write it here, it's not a partial derivative. I know, sorry, sorry for the notation. Uh, here, it's to denote that it is the energy density or the pressure associated to the inflaton. Um, but here, uh, they, they are really partial derivatives. Yeah, good question. Okay, thank you very much. Cool. So, um, close um, the scale invariance problem, um, which is as follows. So, we said that the M flatten was homogeneous and didn't depend on space, but in reality, it does have some deviations away from homogeneity, and we we denote them by another field. Uh, also five, but different um, character. I know it's a bit annoying the notation, but it's common. Um, that does depend on space, uh, so it's not it, it, it's not homogeneous, and we can measure observationally these um, deviations. In particularly, what in particular what we measure is the uh, amplitude of the product of these uh, fields of these deviations, um, so like the expected value. And our observations have some um, remarkable property uh, that's known as a scale invariance. And it basically means that we can rescale all the distances and the amplitudes are really the same thing. They don't change um, over like different cosmological scales. And this is quite magical. And so we would like this to be explained by the physics of inflation. And it turns out that the Sitter space time exponential growth of the scale factor um, gives rise to a scale invariance. Unlike other kinds of accelerated expansion that we may postulate for inflation, like we could have uh, the scale factor growing as t to the n where n is greater than one, and that will give us acceleration, and that will solve the origins and the flatness problem, but it will then explain a scale invariance. Um, Indeed, in the next, in the final part of the talk, I'm going to um, briefly show you or um, give you an idea of why we have a scale invariance in the Sidor space time and not in other space times. But uh, this is the reason why we, in particular, chose the Sidor space time to model inflation and not just any um, accelerated uh, kind of expansion. So um, I will share these slides. Uh, I'm going to skip this. Uh, few parts on the slow roll approximation, but uh, do read uh, on that if, if you're interested. And now uh, we're going to have 
um, quite a quickly introduction to quantum field theory to understand why we have a scaled environs. And first, we are going to do it on Minkowski space time, um, and then we are going to generalize that to to the further value space time, which is the one we care about in inflation. So, how does quantum field theory work? Well, first, uh, let's review classical field theory. Our action uh, we comes from a Lagrangian density. Um, you may be familiar with uh, Lagrangians and our Lagrangian density. The Lagrangian is just uh, really the integral uh, over space of the Lagrangian density, as uh, you could expect from the name. So, the common choice of Lagrangian density is uh, this one here. Uh, and then uh, varying the action, as usual, gives us the equation of motion. In this case, it's known as the Klein Gordon equation. Uh, and then if we take it to Fourier space, that becomes the equation for an harmonic oscillator with this frequency uh, omega, which depends on the momentum. So, what this is really telling us is that we have an harmonic oscillator at every point in Fourier space, which uh, can be quite hard to imagine, uh, I suppose, at least for me it is. But the good thing about the harmonic oscillator is that we know it quite well from quantum mechanics, and so this allows us to quantize our field. And this is what we are going to do now. So we promote our field to a quantum operator, and then we use the ladder operators A and A Daga from uh, the quantum harmonic oscillator position. Um, so we we are working in Fourier space, and we we take uh, the Fourier transfer of of the inflaton to be really uh, it's just like our position operator uh, in like what will be like quantum mechanics. And then for the actual momentum, we use the conjugate momentum uh, that comes from the Lagrangian in the usual way. And it's fully transform. It's really what goes here and it's playing the role of the uh, momentum operator from quantum mechanics. And and the uh, annihilation operator uh, A is just defined in the standard way. And from that, we, we obtain the expression for um, the inflaton in Fourier space. It's again a, a quantum operator. If the minus sign in there looks a bit confusing, it is just so that the inflaton in real space is a real value operator. Um, yeah. And I've been a bit uh, fast, or I haven't given any details really about these uh, operators. Um, a and A Daga, um, but they were really analogously to uh, inducial quantum mechanics. And we can define a vacuum to be the state in our Hilbert space that's annihilated by all the um, annihilation operators at every point in Fourier space. So this is really our ground states, our ground states. And then um, can be shown that the Hamiltonian um, has the familiar term from the uh, one the harmonic oscillator that just the uh, frequency and then a a daga a and then it's integrated over uh, momentum space and then finally the commutation relationship well they are all zero except when we are looking at the commutator of a and a daga evaluated at the same uh, momentum and so the nice thing about this is well if you integrate this uh you get a one, uh, which is what you usually get um, when you, uh, you just have a and a daga in usual quantum mechanics. So, yeah, this was uh, quite uh, an important or hard uh, slide, uh, but I think the main takeaway should be this uh, expression for the inflaton in Fourier space, because, well, now we can Fourier transform back to real space and obtain an expression for the Inflaton, at least in the Schrodinger picture, where um, operators like the inflaton uh, don't depend on time. And so this is the expression we have in Fourier space. And then on the Heisenberg picture, states do not depend on time anymore, but operators do depend on time. And so our inflaton is an operator, so it depends on time. And we obtain it with the usual uh, relationship between the operator in the Heisenberg picture and the operator in the Schrodinger picture. Um, by the way, here H 
is the Hamiltonian, not the Hubble parameter. I know it's uh, yeah, a bit annoying. Uh, but uh, after some algebra, this is the expression that we get, which is uh, invariant, as you can see from the contractions there. So that is quite nice. And yeah, this is the final slide on QFT on Minkowski space, but uh, this expression uh, should be the takeaway that we, we should take for the next, next, next chapter on QFT on, on F4W space time. So, uh, QFT and F4W space time. As I was saying before, uh, we are really looking at deviations away from homogeneity of our field, the inflaton. So we, we write it like this, where uh, this uh, space dependent field is really a small perturbation. And yes, I was saying before the notation is horrible, but um, it seems to be a standard. And I find it particularly annoying because there's a bar there. And, and in LaTeX, uh, when you need to type this, this is bar phi again. So it's just confusion all over the place. <laughs> but uh, away from my rant, um, what we usually do, uh, and this turns out to be a good approximation, is to set the classical background to zero. Uh, we work in the center space time um, as um, we, we, we did before in, in inflation. And then we set the mass term of the Lagrangian density to zero. So we are left uh, just with, this is our action. Uh, it's quite simple, it's just the kinetic term. And so uh, to find the evolution of these fluctuations, uh, we do as usual, we span our action and then uh, find the equation of motion. And here we cannot get rid of the gradient term because we are looking at uh, the inhomogeneity, so the dependent on space. Uh, so we cannot neglect it. And indeed we get this Laplacian in, in the equation of motion in real space. If we take it to Fourier space, uh, we get this one, which is, um, a mix of what we had for um, the classical background, homogeneous background, and then we have this k dependence, uh, which is a bit like the harmonic oscillator. So now what we want to do, we want to quantize the field. And so we write it as a, a linear combinations of um, A and A data. Uh, here F are known as mode functions. And if we were to compare this with the final expression in the Heisenberg picture from QFT in Minkowski space, um, there we will have the small functions going as one over the square root of K for a massless field in Minkowski. And that's just for reference. And how do we find uh, the expression for the mode functions? Well, uh, we use this equation of motion. And it's also quite useful to use uh, conformal time. Uh, this in general, very useful in cosmology. And it can be solved, it's not really hard to show that uh, this is the equation, uh, the differential equation obeyed by the mode functions um, uh, with respect to uh, conformal time tau. And in the limit, in the far past, uh, here the far past, uh, so time tending to minus infinity uh, corresponds to conformal time. Um, Tending again to minus infinity. Um, in that far past, we can neglect this term. And so uh, we get a uh, uh, standard harmonic oscillator that we had in Minkowski space. So although we can solve this um, exactly, we can solve exactly this um, differential equation, we use for it the initial conditions that are such that the mode functions become the mode functions in Minkowski space in the limit of the far past at the start of. Uh, the universe. So using that, um, it's not very hard to show that um, these are the um, form that the mode functions take. And what's important here, at least for um, the final two slides of the talk, is this uh, proportionality factor there, uh, because it will appear on the correlators that we will compute. So what's the power spectrum? Well, it's the two-point correlator in Fourier space. That's the expected value of a product of the fields in Fourier space, where we are taking the expectation value at the vacuum state uh, that I uh, defined previously. It was the one that's annihilated by all the A's. And we take the limit at the end of inflation. And the reason why we take the limit at the end of inflation is 
that we can only measure these correlators at the end of inflation. We do not have observational access to what was happening during inflation. So this is the way to check that our theory is um, right, or at least that it is not wrong. So after telling, uh, taking the limit and using the commutation relationship uh, for the for A and A data, uh, we get this expression. Here we have this uh, three-dimensional Dirac delta function, which is really conservation of momentum because um, this expression is uh, vanishes unless uh, the momentum is moment are conserved, so like unless this sum up to zero. And here I have defined the power spectrum. Uh, which is this well factor of proportionality, which for the heater space time, we just get the uh, factor of proportionality that I was uh, previously mentioned, we get it a square. And so the power spectrum in the case is one over KQ. Whereas for Minkowski, uh, the mode functions went as uh, one over the uh, square root of the momentum. So we get that the power spectrum is one over uh, 2K, uh, what K is the momentum. And with that result, we get to our final slide. Um, and what we do is we Fourier transfer back to real space. And in Minkowski space, the one over k decay of the power spectrum becomes one over the distance square, which is not a scale invariance because, well, if you rescale the distances, you, you get the, the factor, the rescaling factor is still there in your, in your amplitude. Whereas in the sitter space time, the one over k cube decay becomes just a constant uh, term in in real space. So here, uh, this doesn't depend on the like the, the range doesn't depend on the distances. You can rescale, and and this wouldn't change. So this will be indeed a scale invariance, uh, which is the scale invariance property that I previously mentioned that we had uh, for any for a product of any number of um, of the fields here, just with two. Um, well, I think I've barely give you an idea of why um, this is the case. Uh, we have scale invariance which agrees with observational data. And to conclude, this is the reason why we use the Sitter space time to model inflation and not just any odd um, accelerated expansion for the very early universe. Um, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you so much for the talk. That was excellent. Um, well, most people appear to, to just be singing instead of uh, being connected to the audio. I'm sure you can, there would be a lot of clapping uh, if you could hear yeah, it. Um, yeah. Uh, if anyone, way. yeah, if anyone has any questions, uh, feel free to post them in the chat. Uh, otherwise, while, uh, while we wait, uh, I have a few, um, oh, yeah. probably. Yeah, there you go. Um, so, um, could you, um, what's it called? So first of all, could you clarify um, when you say you have your field in terms of creation and annihilation operators, what, what is a field? You, what do you think a field, or what is a field in quantum field theory? Um, because it's not, it's not a classical field, clearly, because then we wouldn't have operators, but what exactly? Uh, yeah, so, um, Take everything I say with like um, having in mind that I have not properly learned quantum field theory other than what I've read this summer for the project. But um, a field is, um, in general, like we are used to think of maybe the electromagnetic field, um, which is really a vector or like, well, so sorry, that's the electric field, or we could have the electromagnetic field. And they are functions that. Uh, depend on can depend on space and time and, and so again it's 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 a function that changes um throughout time and throughout the space and what we do it in quantum field theory well we keep the same um space time dependence but we promote it to a like hermitian quantum operator that we can observe and like that behave just like as operators in quantum mechanics. Uh, that's my intuition. Like for a field, it's something that uh, changes uh, across um, space time. And then at the same time, it's uh, an operator. So it's a space dependent okay. operator, if that helps. 
So it's like at every single point in, in time, in space time, you have a specific operator, which is yeah, so like this field. Yeah, so you could tell me uh, at this location, at this time, and it had this value, or like the operator had this shape, but then, and you could tell me, well, uh, after some time, what was the uh, shape of the operator at that particular point in space time? Um, yeah, I think that's the idea. Okay, thank you very much. Um, it does not appear that many people are, are writing questions. Feel, feel very, very free to do that. Or just, if you think writing is, is too much labor, um, just unmute yourself. Um, just, um, yeah, one more question. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you wrote um, on the scale invariance, you took yeah. your perturbation fields and you took an, um, before that in the experimental data. Um, so you were talking about what problem does uh, oh, inflation yeah. solve? Um, yeah. What are you averaging over? Yeah, so that's that's a bit annoying, but um, because the, the way it's written here, or, or at least uh, having seen a bit of QFT, for me that mathematically mean well you are just taking the expectation the expectation with the uh, vacuum state um of the theory but i think um how they do it uh is that like they average were like many measurements i think like the, the way they do it is either like they assume that the time average is the same as the spatial average or or the other way around but um, I should claim like epistemic humility and, and tell you that I have no idea what that means. I, I just, okay. I'm a mathematician, I just read the, uh, the data and uh, okay, that's fine. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, um, right. Um, okay, so it seems like uh, nobody else has any questions, so this has been an excellent talk. Um, yeah. um, it just yeah, so then I think I will end the recording. Um, and if anybody would want would want to ask questions without being recorded, you're also very free to do that. Yeah.